dark energy and dark matter are held accountable for 95% of the universe. The decades since dark energy was incorporated into our physical models, um, we've still sadly got no direct evidence of its existence. Is it time to seriously consider the exist that, that the existence of dark energy is nothing but an empty hypothesis, but not one that we desperately need to make our current account of the universe credible? To help us answer these questions, um, we have on my right, Sabir Sakai, um, head of particle physics theory group at the University of Oxford. To my left, we have Roger Penrose, physicist, mathematician, philosopher, all around clever clogs. <laughs> <laughs> to his left, Catherine Haynes, professor of astrophysics, European Research Council fellow at the University of Edinburgh, based at the Institute for Astronomy. Is dark energy just an empty hypothesis um, used to make our current theory as well? Catherine, can I start with you? So I have the, um, the great honour to try and explain what this term dark energy actually means to sort of set the scene and then I'll answer your question, David. Um, so our universe is expanding. Uh, so uh, Slife and Hubble were looking at distant galaxies and everywhere they looked, they saw those galaxies were moving away from us and they concluded that our universe was expanding. Astronomers were looking at even more distant galaxies and they found that not only was the universe expanding, but that expansion was getting faster. The expansion is getting faster and faster every day, and we call this the accelerated expansion of the universe. Now, the term dark energy is what we use to describe what's causing this accelerated expansion. Now, it's got the term energy in there because we need some new source of energy in our universe to power this accelerated expansion. And it's got the word dark in front of it, um, simply so we can say, Dark energy. <laughs> um, because we're all like Star Wars geeks at heart. There's nothing really dark about it. Uh, it's quite misleading, that whole concept of dark. Anyway, it's a new source of energy. In David's introduction, he said that there was no direct evidence for the existence of uh, this dark energy. And I, I would disagree no. with you there because we have a, an amazing body of evidence now since his first discovery in 1998. Um, we have been targeting the universe in lots of different ways to, and all of these different experiments are coming out with the same conclusion that the expansion of our universe is accelerating. Now, what could be causing this accelerated expansion? I like to think about these big expanses of the universe where there's absolutely nothing, uh, no stars, no galaxies, no gas, and uh, it's a complete vacuum. But quantum physics tells us that actually in a vacuum there's lots of stuff. There are virtual particles that can pop in and out of existence. And because we have an expanding universe, that vacuum gives us energy. Quantum physics is linking with the universe on a large scale to give us this accelerated expansion. And it's a beautiful theory, but unfortunately, if the predictions of this quantum theory are correct, we wouldn't be here. Our universe would have expanded so rapidly in the early stages that the first stars and galaxies wouldn't have formed and we wouldn't be here um, to talk about it. And so we have this entire zoo now of different theories to explain this accelerated expansion and they are all under this global umbrella of dark energy. Why should you get excited about it? Well, uh, as David said at the start, we don't understand this huge, huge amount of the universe. You could see that as a major failing of us as scientists, but I see it as a wonderful opportunity for discovery because when you don't understand something as huge as 95% of the universe, it means you're missing a key piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Sylvia, so, yeah, would you like to... <clears throat> I don't believe dark energy exists. I believe that the evidence that Catherine just alluded to, the accelerating expansion, uh, is an incorrect inference uh, because I've been studying the data and that is my... Uh, observational belief, uh, but I have a theoretical prejudice, and I think we all, all of us do have prejudices, we should make it clear. Dark energy is not a new concept, I think she suggested, it actually goes back a hundred years. Uh, in fact, when Einstein was formulating the first cosmological model, uh, shortly after inventing his amazing general theory of relativity, um, he at that time had no access to data. We didn't even know we lived in a galaxy far less that the galaxies you know, are going away from each other. In fact, he based it largely on something called Mach's principle, which you are going to hear, which was later discredited, by the way. So uh, basically, he chose the simplest possibility at the time, and 
that simplest possibility is that the universe is exactly isotropic and homogeneous, which today we know it is not. And this universe can have matter. In fact, at that time it was called dust, pressureless matter. That's all they knew. And uh, it could have curvature, space-time curvature you know about. And it could also have, because of the underlying symmetry of the theory that underlay it, general coordinate invariance, it could have something called a cosmological constant. And that appeared to have an opposite effect to gravity. So in fact, because Einstein thought the universe must be static, he chose it to balance the attractive force of gravity. And later, when it turned out that the universe was actually expanding, he abandoned the thing. But in fact, it is not his choice whether to have that constant or not. It is a property allowed by the underlying mathematics, and therefore it must be there. The problem is this, that subsequently we discovered that the universe doesn't just have dust. At early times, it was dominated by radiation, and even earlier than that, it was dominated by quantum fields. And as she just said, fields have fluctuations, and these fluctuations carry energy. And if you estimate how much they contribute to this cosmological constant, it is so huge compared to the scale of the universe today. So the universe has an energy scale. It's roughly, if you like, the inverse of its size. So it's very big universe, so that scale is tiny, it is uh, 10 to the minus 42 GeV, GeV is the mass of a proton. Uh, for comparison, today we are exploring physics at places like the Large Hadron Collider at energies of a thousand GeV. So there is 45 orders of magnitude between the two scales. And if you follow Roger to the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 19 GeV, you have another huge hierarchy there. And our naive estimate would be that all these quantum fluctuations should contribute to this cosmological constant. Einstein says they do. But if they did, we would not be here, as Catherine also remarked. Clearly, there is a big problem here. Now, to me, to sweep that problem under the rug and then to invoke a tiny dark energy, which is actually of the scale of the Hubble parameter today, is simply dishonesty. It is intellectual dishonesty. It is not facing up to the fact that we have a big problem with understanding how vacuum energy couples to gravity and to ignore that and to then use it for purposes such as driving inflation, you know, making the expansion accelerate today. This is, to me, not satisfactory at all. So I went to look at the data and I discovered that the universe is not really accelerating and all the other evidence that Catherine will tell you that exists is inferred from that simple cosmological model that Einstein and others after him proposed, that does not take into account that the universe today is not perfect, it is not homogeneous, it may be filled with matter that does not have ideal fluid equation of state. So there are many possibilities, they're very complicated, it is extremely hard mathematically to formulate, to find solutions of Einstein's equations when the situation is not absolutely symmetric as it was in Einstein's theory. So, uh, I, I gave you my watch. I didn't tell you that is a biased watch. It stops when I <laughs> <laughs> But uh, let me, let me come that, to that. I think that is let that me come to that. <laughs> so, my punchline is the following. Cosmology is too important to be left to cosmologists. <laughs> when you said that the universe is, is, is not homogeneous, do you mean that? Um, we can't sort of, it's not evenly spread out. Precisely. Other parts of the universe might not look like this. Precisely. Okay, right. I just want to make sure. Um, follow that, Roger. First of all, let, let me backtrack a little bit. <laughs> when Einstein introduced, <laughs> as Silvio mentions, the cosmological constant in 1917, he introduced this term for the wrong reason, as you say. It didn't, it, he, he didn't know that the universe was expanding and he, and he found he needed to put this term in. It's the only thing you can do, I should mention, without wrecking his theory. So he knew he could put this one number in, which is referred to as the cosmological constant. But even though Einstein then retracted it, had, it said that he regarded this as, this as his greatest blunder, even so... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.